All right, here we go. We are in the middle of chapter 38. Uh, we are what begins with the chitas, either of the 24th of Adar, Bays, or the 4th of Nisan. And in this, the beginning of this chapter, the Alter Rebbe has been talking about the concept of kavana. Uh, we have this, I guess, sort of tension commonly between uh, doing and what is the meaning behind doing it? What is the intent? The word kavana literally translates as balance, and it suggests the awareness of Hashem in the mitzvah action. A person can do a mitzvah because it's habit. They can do a mitzvah because it's a social benefit, or they can do it because it's purely Hashem's will. Now, the Alter Rebbe has quoted the statement that a mitzvah done without kavana is like a body without a soul. Now, that has two characteristics to it. On the one hand, it does it is a mitzvah. So if it, there's been a time that I once did a mitzvah that I didn't have godly intent, I should not dismiss that and say, well, it was better that I didn't do it. Just like if I need something and somebody helps me, sure, I'd love them to do it with passion and because they have joy in helping me that they like to do it for me. But if I really, really need it, <laughs> I'll take what I can get. So if they'll do it, and even if they do it just out of habit or out of a sense of duty, without any passion and joy, that's certainly better than not doing it. But we're not here, and the Alter Rebbe did not write Tanya just for, well, that's better than not. Okay, fine. But we don't want to live a life that, well, it's better than, uh, the, for, than not or for mediocrity or something shallow like that. We want it to be filled with passion. Now, in this part of the chapter that we're about to start today, we're going to come across a couple of concepts, which I thought it might be beneficial to review, there's nothing here that you probably haven't heard before, but it's, I think, a good idea to bring it to the fore of everybody's thinking. And then when we get to it in the, in the text, it'll be a little easier for you. So you're all, we are all familiar that the four letters of Hashem's name, the Yud and He and Vav and He uh, form, which we do not pronounce phonetically because it's not a word, meaning unlike all the other titles for Hashem, uh, like we have in English, they also are words. Elohim can mean judges, um, just like almighty is a word. Lord means the boss. Uh, Adoni, which I'm deliberately not pronouncing as we do, means the authority. But the Yud and He and Vav and He name of Hashem is not pronounced phonetically because it's not a word, unlike all the other names of Hashem, which are also words. But the, we capitalize them in English to show that they're a reference to the infinity of Hashem. The yud ke vav ke is, in a certain sense, defiant of worldly character because it contains all the letters that make up the words for all three forms of tense, past tense, present tense, future tense, which, of course, in creation, in the, in the world of limited logic and reason, cannot coexist. It can't be yesterday, today, and tomorrow all at the same time. But of course, Hashem is not bounded by such limitations. The upside of that unboundedness is infinite. It's very exciting. The downside is, well, I don't know what to do with it. I need there to be a yesterday, a today, and tomorrow in order for me to participate, not simply to be awed by Hashem's infinity. So the combo of Yud and He, Vav and He, which are past, present, and future all at the same time, is something that it impacts my life, trickles down into my life, but it's not something I'm immediately, uh, let's use this word, comfortable with. But it is that which Hashem is most comfortable with, even though it's also a form of limitation because it's recognizing the concepts of past, present, and future. And of course, those concepts themselves don't even exist within the infinity of Hashem. So through this process, as is represented within the very letters, the shapes and sounds of the four letters, we start to understand how Hashem goes through this process we call Tzimtzum and Hester Ponim, two important words. Tzimtzum is Hashem withholding himself so as not to overwhelm us. And hopefully people recall the analogy of the homework when the kid says to the father, what's the answer? So if the father's interested in being the hero, he tells the kid the answer. But of course, if he tells the kid the answer, the kid doesn't learn. So he is 
does tsum He holds back from what because he really doesn't want to see his child frustrated with not knowing the answer. So his impulse is the answer. And yet, because of his love for the child, he holds back, even though that feels frustrating to the child. And the child says, well, you're mean. All the other par- kids' parents tell them the answers. Or you're, inco- you're incompetent. You don't know. You're not telling me because you don't know the answer. When truly, and we hope, the child says, wow, my parent is so loving that they're not just going to do what's easiest for them. Okay, kid, leave me alone. Here's the answer. Or dun da da I'll be the hero and I'll tell you the answer. Rather, the parent works with the child gradually so that the child truly and completely grasps it. This is one idea called Tsimtsu. A similar but markedly different idea, which we're going to discover, is called Hester Punim, which translates as the concealment of the face. And as just like a person's face is more recognizable than their hand, uh, you know, we're looking here at Zoom. Sometimes you can recognize the person by their name. You can recognize them by their face. But if you just held your hand up, it'd be a lot harder to. So when we talk about Hester Punim, this is a reference to Hashem concealing his overwhelming presence. And again, the more Hashem asserts his presence, the harder it is for us to have any sense of existence, like the parent who was so overly present that the child has no opportunity for uh, their own identity. Now, Hashem, again, in his great desire to be connected with us, and one of the core points that we're going to reemphasize in this chapter, which we've heard before, is it's all about what Hashem wants. That's what we're consumed with. We hope Hashem is consumed with what we want, and we are consumed with what Hashem wants. Hashem, in his desire to be connected with us, goes through this process of tzimtzum and hesterpanim, which sometimes feels very frustrating, and it even feels sometimes almost like, I'll use this term, mean, like, why don't you just tell me? Uh, In order, again, to give us that opportunity. And it's orderly. It's not just chaotic and sporadic. Just as, again, the parent, hopefully, is not just randomly withholding information. And they're not just withholding. They're withholding the answer that the child is clamoring for. And concurrently, they are trickling down uh, data and information and opportunity to give the child the the chance to come to the recognition and the realization of the answer themselves and in the process to become bonded with the parent. Now, these process, this process takes essentially four stages, as is represented by the four letters of Hashem's name. It is also represented in another set of four that we're familiar with, which is a one method or one form through which we categorize all of creation. There is that which is inanimate. It doesn't even bespeak any godliness, like minerals like rocks it doesn't even have a sign of life so that's like the child uh, or the student feeling completely abandoned by the parent as if the parent is not sharing anything with them then there is uh tzomeach, the vegetative at least it shows some life it grows um, so there's some sense of life there there's some sense of godliness then there is the chai which is alive, animals, they have mobility, they have uh, mood, they become aggressive, they become playful, they become uh, excited, whatever it is, uh, of an animal. So that much more. And then the most profoundly uh, demonstrative of its godliness is midaber, which translates as articulate, which is a reference to human beings. Now, if you look here, I hope you can see my screen. I'll go right to left, left to right. We'll do the right to left. So the first one is Yud. Yud is the first letter of Hashem's name. So I don't know if you can see it here. It's just a little tiny line that looks like a Yud. That's the font, sorry. Um, but if you really break it down, and we had a sofa, a scribe, draw a Yud, there's actually a tiny pinch uh, point on the tip of a Yud. Uh, it doesn't show up here in this font, which just makes it like a little half line, but a more uh, precise drawing would show that it's got a tiny little point called the kutz, the, the point of the, the tip of the yud. That is tiniest, 
which in our context means it's the most profound because if something's a 57 Chevy and it's big and gigantic and loud, it's limited to how big and gigantic and loud it is. When something is small, it's more like we're familiar with, you know, you have a thumb drive that's a, a, a teensy uh, chip. They just have to put it in a casing so it doesn't get lost and it holds, you know, 100,000 audio books type of thing. So when a sofa begins to write any letter, they begin with the yud shape and then they stretch it. They stretch it into an olive or a base, whatever it may be. So this represents the closest we can get to that alignment with Hashem, which is manifest in our human experience, in our experience of creation as the human, uh, the human form or the, 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 the articulate one. That's the yud. But it, they, it's teeny. And therefore, it's very hard to get our intellectual arms around it. When we get to the letter hey, so you recognize the shape of the letter hey, it's got breadth, it's got depth. And if you use a little imagination, you could see like where a yud would start, and then you'd stretch it out and you'd stretch it down and so on. So this represents more uh, evident. Uh, it's a little bit more about this world, because in our context, sort of bigger is more self and less Hashem. This represents that quality of, of the animal, which in this context is a virtuous thing, meaning it's alive and it's got mobility, it's got character. It even has some sense, not of intellect in the sense of imagination, but it can be trained, it can learn, uh, and so on. Which in our development of intellect is also the quality of understanding. We start to develop an idea, we start to comprehend it, we start to get our intellectual arms around it. And the yud and hey, you may, you'll also recognize, although this doesn't become a topic of discussion in this chapter, but you'll recognize that the yud and the hey are themselves a form of Hashem's name. It's the end of hallelujah, ka, because the yud and hey that come at the end of that word, which we don't pronounce phonetically unless we're in davening, is itself Hashem's name. Hallelujah, ka. Then we get the vav, the vav with its vertical uh, length, so it's again, you imagine the yud like a like a, a, a window shade, you've dragged it down, you've pulled it down. This represents again more growth, the vegetative in Hebrew, tzomeach, and more evident godliness than the inanimate, than the rock, but not as much as the animal. It doesn't have mode, it doesn't have mobility, it doesn't have any kind of trainability. It's just an apple tree. But the fact that it's alive and it produces more apples and apples produce apples, again, it, it's further de demonstrative of godliness in contrast to that last hay, which is the inanimate, and that final hay, which is the part of godliness that is entrusted to us. This is the part of Hashem that he has given to us. We don't see it as godliness. Our first thing that we recognize is ourselves, and Hashem is, oh yeah, that too. Uh, it's it's that sort of classic thing. I know I exist, and then I speculate about whether God exists. And we're trying to turn it around, and we say, I know that God exists. Well, then how can I exist? Can, how can I exist if God exists? Because God is infinite, so where do I come in? Well, God says that I exist, so I guess I really exist. And that sort of existential question, how do we know that we truly exist? Our answer is, um, because God exists, that's the absolute. And since God acknowledges our existence, we must ipso facto exist. We definitively exist because God says that we exist and God's existence is unquestionable. I know it sounds like a word game and it's a little bit outside of our uh, topic here, but the idea being that the four categories of creation, the inanimate, the, the vegetative, the animal alive, the articulate human represent varying shades of awareness of Hashem. The least aware is the inanimate. The most aware is the articulate. And we are sort of start off in that inanimate uh, uh, awareness, uh, degree of awareness. Wake up in the morning and I know I exist. That's for sure. And I work throughout the day to try to come to an awareness that Hashem exists. It's maturity. It's just like every parent has to train their child uh, that not everything you, you want do you do because there are other people. In fact, it's historically been traditional, just to illustrate this point, that when they begin to study Gemara with boys in the third grade or fourth grade, whatever it is, so where do you start? It's so vast. Where do you start? 
So it's historically traditional, and I believe till this very day, that they begin with a chapter that describes what is the responsibility if one finds something in the street. Can you keep it? Do you have to return it? How long do you have to wait? So why do they choose this? So there's all kinds of reasons why this has evolved. One is it's something that a kid can understand. It's not abstract. It's a basic point. You walk down the street, you find a quarter, you find something with someone's name on it. What are your responsibilities? And then there's a moral ethical lesson that a child has to learn that not everything you see is yours. But that's, you know, like it's the classic thing. Every parent's had it. You know, you sit the child in your lap and they're grabbing them. Stop touching that. Stop touching this. You know, they go through the grocery store. You stop touching this. You stop touching this. There's the, the story about the parent who says, I told my kids all that candy in the checkout aisle was fake. Then we'd laugh at all the people who were buying fake candy. Ha ha ha. Because, you know, that. OK, so that that's the process. We begin with the total self-awareness, the inanimate. We don't even grow. We don't even share with the world like an apple tree that produces apples, the animal that produces and so on. And we hope that we grow and we progress to um, to greater awareness of something outside of myself. And we've probably all encountered people who are grown who've never learned that and they're just completely self-absorbed. So this is one process of the tzimtzum um, and the hester, the, the tzimtzum, I'm sorry, that, uh, that we encounter. Now, again, hopefully you can sort of see where the analogy is back to the mitzvah kavana balance. So the mitzvah is to do the action, eat the matzah. That is the mitzvah. And if a person eats matzah because it tastes good, because it gives them a sense of nostalgia, because their friend told them that they have to, because if you do that, then you're gonna get the big fancy meal. It is a mitzvah and one should never underestimate that. Mitzvah is absolutely 100% a mitzvah, no question. And we are looking for the kavana. So if we eat the matzah because that's what you're supposed to do, or I don't know, it tastes good, or I like the conversation and I like the food that comes after it, that's eating matzah with an awareness at an inanimate level. And again, each stage along the way, to a more and more profound level of awareness and understanding, what we are uh, titling here simply as kavana, as our progress, as our awareness makes progress, we are pushing through the tzimtzum. So this is one formula where kavana uh, uh, works through the tzimtzum, not in opposition to the tzimtzum, and, that, and that this is an important distinction which we're going to get to. It works through the tzimtzum because we got to start somewhere. So we tell the child, if you do well in school, I'll buy you a toy. So it's a low level of kavana. When I say low, meaning it's not aware of the infinity of Hashem. And of course, we hope that as they grow, they mature and they come to a greater awareness and they're not still doing mitzvahs simply because they're going to get cookies. Okay, that's a process that we work through the tzimtzum. Then there's another series of four that also follows this type of pattern. And you know, this is one of the concepts that Tanya brings to the world, Hasidus in general. It gives us um, human chartable uh, uh, handles to help us understand and process uh, these sort of esoteric ideas. So we're following here a pattern of four. So here is a quote from a Pusik. It's in the book of Kings. Um, you see here in 1909. The word of Hashem came to him. This is Elio. Why are you here, Elio? He replied, I am moved by the zeal for Hashem, Lord of hosts. The Lord said to him, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. So what happens here? Hashem is speaking to Elio, a Navi. And Elio, the prophet says, I want to see Hashem, which is essentially what we are talking about here. Kavana is the desire, the impulse, the effort to see godliness in the mitzvah. Because sometimes it's very hard to see God in eating matzo or shaking the lulav. Like, I want to see God. I want to have a godly experience. And I, okay, you want a godly experience? Eat matzo. Okay, I mean, where's the godly experience? So this is what Elio is, is asking for. What happened? Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. So there is a presumption that where am I going to see Hashem? When the sea will split, when miracles that will overwhelm me when the world will open up its eyes and there will be complete, then I'll see Hashem. So this is a, a not uncommon presumption and even perhaps aspiration 
that one day I'm going to see uh, uh, mountains floating in the sky. I'm going to see such a defiance of nature that I will find godliness. But what happened? It says, but the Lord was not in the wind, not being the, the point here. After the wind was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. So there are three things where Hashem was not visible. This is what we know of, and we've seen before, as the three completely, or holy with a W-H-O-L-L-Y, three completely, we call them unclean, klipos. Because there are three separate events here where you would think you would find God. And what does it say? Hashem was not in the wind, not in the earthquake, not in the fire. So these are, this is the source from this Pusik in Malachim and Kings, that Hashem is not in the three klipas, shalosh klipas tameis lagamri, the three, again, we call them completely holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, unclean or tame um, uh, uh, klipas, the three plied thick uh, shell that so squashes the godliness. This is what we refer to as Hester Punim, the concealment of the face. That is, you can't see Hashem there. So we look at, you know, you can think about idolatry, uh, evil, and so on. You can't imagine that there's God. Is there godliness there? Of course. You know, we're coming up to Tishabov. Is there God? Yeah, that's why the Rambam tells us that when Mashiach will come, not only will Tisha B'Av not be a sad day, it'll be a celebration. Why should it be a celebration? Because deep down within it, there really is a celebration. What? I can't believe that. Okay, that's why until now, uh, we've had to sit on the floor, et cetera, et cetera, because we can't even imagine that there could be something godly in Tisha B'Av. Understood? Um. But it is there, but like it was not in the wind, not in the earthquake, and not in the fire, it was a Hester Punim. I don't want to say complete, but complete. <laughs> you can't see it from here. But where is it? After the fire, a still small voice. Now, it doesn't say the Lord was in the still small voice, but you could imagine that it was there. So again, not only is this the counterintuitive that we think that Hashem is found in miracles, Hashem is found in the most profound, and so on, but and, and the, the pushback is that Hashem is found here in the small, still voice. Small, still voice, come on, highlight, there we go. Now I'll turn it like blue or something, so you know, my computer lingo, the still, small voice, that's where you'll find Hashem in what we call the klipa. It's not obvious, it's still a still, small voice, but Noga, there's some light seeping through. You could imagine that godliness is there. So again, we have four stages. These four, which are from bottom up, least evidently godly is the is a rock. There's godliness in a rock. This rock doesn't even show anything. Well, but there's rocks. There's got to be a rock maker. So I got to be able, to, or I can I have the opportunity to extrapolate the existence of Hashem from the rock, because if there's a rock, there's got to be a rock maker. When I see a vegetable, when I see a tree, and I see a flower, I see even weeds, the fact that they, that, they, uh, that they are alive, that they grow, that they uh, blossom, and so on. So there's got to be a, a little more evidently godliness. I move on to the animal. I can see the playfulness. I see it's alive. I feel its life in my hands. I feel its heart beating. I feel its pulsating existence. I can imagine that there's got to be a creator. And I come to a human being who not only is alive and has the capacity to join together via speech, to bring together and form community and so on, which is unity, which is the oneness of Hashem, that's a greater awareness. So this top line here, this top series of four, is the tzimtzum. It starts off with an unawareness, but not an oppositional unawareness, a progressive deliberate attempt or, or effort or process better process through which I can come from something I can deal with to a level that I didn't think I could. So this is one procedure. And again, our context is about Kavana. So the way we're going to import these ideas into our chapter is about the idea of Kavana. And Kavana is bringing awareness of Hashem into the behavior. We have a behavior, eat matzah. 
We want to have an awareness of Hashem. We can have a domain, a mineral, inanimate level of awareness, because that's where we start. We tell the child, come eat matzah. That's what we're doing. We're eating matzah now. Okay, I eat matzah. Then we give them a little bit more awareness. You know, we eat matzah because our ancestors left Egypt. We eat matzah because it's humility. We eat matzah because it aligns us with the infinity of Hashem. All of the procedures that we're familiar with. Another series, which is similar but different, here it's not a, a, a step towards the direction. It's not a progressive progression. Rather, this is more oppositional. Hashem was not in the wind, meaning he was totally not visible, not in the earthquake, not in the fire. This is what is called Kabbalistically Hester Ponim, concealment, like Esther means to be concealed, Ponim of the face, of godliness, Hester Ponim. So both of them are, they, they feel the same, although they are markedly different. The top series is a uh, elementary to more advanced progression. So stage one, although I don't imagine that there's godliness there, but that's because I am not ready for it and I'm sort of being worked up. In this area, now it's oppositional. Now this, this is antagonism against godliness. So the pushback to that, and again, we're dealing with the kavana. We're, we're talking about the person who's doing the mitzvah. They're eating the matzah. That's not the issue. The issue is whether or not they're sensing any godliness. And as we read in the introduction to Tanya, this is essentially the audience that the Alter Rebbe was addressing. The Alter Rebbe was addressing an audience that didn't feel that they were connected with Hashem. They were doing it. They were what we would call in our modern parlance, you know, from. They were compliant with the instructions. They were eating matzah on Pesach and had mezuzahs and tefillin and Shabbos and kosher. And yet there was no kavana. There was no sense that this had anything to do with godliness. Okay, now what? When, when are you going to take me in the basement and show me the good stuff? You know, when am I going to, when, when am I going to be trusted with being able to see the godliness? So this is all as a form of introduction. And now we're ready to start to see how we can plug it in to the, to the, to the uh, text in the time. So again, we're in chapter 38. We're about, I don't know, a third of the way through. Uh, where we're up to is the, is the um, chitas for either the 4th of Nisan or the 24th of Adar 2. And here we go. Key at the altar says, because v'guf ha'gashmi mamash ka'vonim v'afar in our physical body. So we are essentially no different. That is, the, our, our physical body has a similar uh, natural awareness of Hashem, like a stone, like the dirt. You know, it's not designed to be insulting to call a person dirt or a rock. What we mean is our natural humanity doesn't have awareness of Hashem because it's just a combination of physiological phenomena. Hebe bechines tzimtzum. That's the tzimtzum gadol, asherin kamayu, the most profound, the uppest, mostest, topis, the most intense form of tzimtzum. And again, tzimtzum, I know this is going to sound maybe silly, tzimtzum is our friend, right? which I mean, it feels frustrating. And yet tzimtzum is the necessity, just like imagine, you know, when you learn how to drive or you learn how to, I don't know, operate a computer. So you sit down, you want to be Beethoven. I want to go on the Lakeshore Drive and go 70 miles an hour. Well, they, they, we're going to give you the car only goes five miles an hour. We're only going to go around the parking lot. You're so mean because it's a symptom. But without that, you're never getting to the more intense level and the more awareness level. You're not getting there. And again, even though the symptom in, the, in isolation is very non-sensitized to godliness, but that's not because it's antagonistic. It's the building block and the process and the progress, as we talked about. Bahai is Shaboy, the life force, that is the godliness within it, muetas. It's very small. It, there isn't a lot of godliness. Eat matzah. Why? It's Pesach. Okay, what is that? Why are we eating matzah on Pesach and shaking the lulav on sukkah? That's what we do. Okay. And again, it's not designed, God forbid, to mock it. It's a progression. That's what we're ready. You're going to go explain to a four-year-old the intensity of all of matzah. It's, it's, it would be cruel to do that because they're not, a, they're not what we call a keili. They're not receptive to it. 
So it's not withholding, it's a progression. We underestimate it, just to share uh, a quick uh, thought. When a boy becomes bar mitzvah, his father makes a bracha. And the bracha sounds very odd. He says, blessed are you Hashem, who has released me from this penalty. <laughs> so he said, what is that? You know, here's this great simcha, everybody's so happy. Why? So the st standard interpretation is because until the kid is 13, it's all the father's responsibility. And if the child does something wrong, the father, now it's the kid's own responsibility. But that doesn't sit well, you know, it doesn't sound very inspiring. So the Rebbe, of course, gives a different interpretation. The Rebbe says, what does this mean? That every parent knows that their greatest aspiration is to protect their child and to give their child uh, the smoothest, most pain-free life. Nobody wants to ever see their child get a paper cut. So we swaddle them in hand sanitizer and we wrap them in bubble wrap because we're afraid. And when the child becomes bar mitzvah, the, he says to the father, you no longer have to be afraid. I can go, you know, I'll ride my bike three miles to go and help somebody. I can do all of this. No, no, that's okay. Don't hurt yourself. The child rebels. And I mean this in a complimentary sense from the, I'm not a child anymore. If they need my help, I can do it. I can uh, help this kid. I can go make a minion, whatever it may be. So again, we as parents struggle. We, we tim to our kids because we love them. But they feel sometimes that and sometimes we're important, not us. I mean, sometimes we start, we, we too much symptom them because we don't know, but Hashem, he knows. Okay. So that's the first level. That is, it's a level of symptom comparable to the stone, the inanimate item. It doesn't even have the power of growth like the next stage, which is the vegetable stage, the, veget the, the vegetable stage, which, which grows. It has some sense of life. In the tzomeach level, in the vegetable level, and again, we're not just talking about apple trees. We're talking about in our own life, our own awareness. It's less simsum, more awareness of godliness. And again, to use an analogy, you know, when a child learns their multiplication tables, they just have to memorize one times one is one, one times two is two. They just memorize them because it's necessary. But they don't have any awareness, they don't grasp the concept that three times two is three, two times. So if I tell you three times two is six, why should you know that two times three is six? Because you haven't mastered the concept. Then you start to master the concept. Now you have awareness and awareness. Now, as we know, unfortunately, what happens, we get, sometimes people get frustrated and they just want to jump right into something that's a little over their head. You know, and this is that challenge, the same thing in our Yiddishkeit. Person's all excited and gung ho. All right, I'm coming for Shabbos. They come and they're waiting for that. But again, Hashem was not in the earthquake, not in the fire, not in the wind. But we think it is. It's a little bit our animalistic soul. You know, it's a little bit our Hollywood uh, desire for something exciting and so on. Okay. The derechlal, generally speaking, nechlekes, these stages of awareness, and again, this is one of the gifts of Hasidus, it puts parameters and charts on what is essentially unchartable. I mean, how can we chart infinity? But we're, we're doing the best we can. La'arba madregais into four stages. Doimem, literally means mute or inanimate, rocks. Tzemeach, blossoms, vegetable. Chai, alive, or animals. Medaber literally translates as articulate, human, because it's the distinction between the human and an animal. I mean, an animal also has a nervous system and a, a respiratory system, etc. But medaber is not only a unique skill. I mean, birds can fly. So why is that better uh, that we can speak? Because the capacity for speech is what creates community and allows a person to get over themselves. So the, Hashem creates the world through speech. We create unity through speech. We know, of course, we can do nasty things with speech because wherever there's an opportunity for sanctity, there's an opportunity for the abuse of that sanctity. Conceptually, medaber speech is the distinctively godly characteristic of the human being. Kenegad, and this parallels Dalid Oisies, the four letters, Shem Havaya Baruchu, of, and again, the Alter Rebbe 
uses the code name Havaya uh, because we don't spell out Hashem's name. But as we went through, it's the very letters and the shapes of the letters that become the model for how we um, can, can chart out this progression. And again, to, to, just like all math, you know, we have this, uh, it comes up at uh, this time of year also with the fast days. You know, when does the fast start? You look on this chart, it has got this time. You look on that chart, it's got that time. I mean, they're off by five minutes. What's going on? Well, one of the reasons is, it doesn't say in Shulchan Aruch that the fast ends at a certain time on our clock. It has to do with how many degrees below the horizon that the sun, the sun has set. It's, it's an imperfect science, meaning when we predict, predict out by the farmer's almanac when sunset is going to be in five years from now, even that is not perfect because the atmosphere changes. So math, we are trying to put hard, rigid stops and categorizations onto concepts that are infinite. So how much more so when we're trying to put it on Hashem himself? That all of life or all of existence is drawn from them. And just as it is incomparable the awareness level of Hashem, what he describes here as the drawing down of life, that is the godliness, the awareness of Hashem is incomparable when we contrast the rock and the vegetative in one group and the animal living and the human communicator articulate in another group. And remember, as we talked about, the first two letters of Hashem's name, the Yud and He, are themselves already Hashem's name, Hallelujah. Again, that idea. Um, Even though it's the same godliness. Is there more godliness in Yom Kippur than Tuesday? Is there more godliness in the Holy of Holies than in the grocery store or even in uh, the Kremlin? Answer, no, it's the same. What's the difference? In the Holy of Holies, you see it. In the bank, you don't see it. On Yom Kippur, you're more sensitized to it, or it's more expressive. Just like, you know, you love your child, the same on every day is on their birthday. So the fact that today's their birthday means you, it's more, you're more aware of it, but it doesn't change the essence of it. And what happens, though, in the Tzimtzum process, the godliness is enclosed in a garment. We'll talk about that in a moment. But and the garment is noiga. It allows light to pass through. You recall earlier in Tanya, the Alter Rebbe uses the analogy that when a person hugs the king, even though the king is wearing his robe, he doesn't say I hug the robe because he wouldn't just hug the robe. The robe is significant because the king is wearing it. So when he hugs the king. He's hugging the king in the robe, and the robe is significant. Now, you might say, aye, but the robe is interfering, his hugging the king. So we explain, even though it's interfering, it's still considered hugging the king. And without the robe, I might not know that he's the king. How do I know he's the king? Because he's wearing the king's robes. He's wearing the king's costume. So the garment, on the one hand, it is a form of concealment. On the other hand, it's a form of expression. Because without the garment, I don't know that it's the king. So here the Alter Rebbe says the same idea. Similarly, when we are relating with Hashem, so there's all kinds of ways in which we relate with Hashem. We relate with Hashem conceptually. We think about Hashem. We relate with Hashem emotionally. We feel a desire to be connected, love. We feel a sense of awe and reverence for Hashem. Where will we find the expression of Hashem without the garments, without the Hester Ponim, this concealment, this almost antagonistic, maybe it's more than almost, this antagonistic 
declaration of the physical that clamors for its own independent intent, attention, where is that most profound? In the physical mitzvahs. Now, this itself is a radical point that the Alter Rebbe comes down on. The common perception was, and maybe even still is, that where are you going to find godliness in the detachment from worldliness, in the uh, 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 isolation and uh, contemplation and so on. But just because I ate some crackers on Pesach or I shook the lulav, or I sat in the sukkah, or I heard the shoifer, doesn't seem, it doesn't feel like it's got that same uh, uh, spiritual uh, uh, bang like all of that contemplation and so on. So that in and of itself is a radical point that the Alter Rebbe is making, like we saw before in that Pesach. The presumption is we're going to see godliness in the earthquake and the fire and the wind. That's where we think godliness, not us, we're perfect, but that's where there's a presumption that godliness is to be found in the miraculous and the transformative and the splitting of seas. And the message that Hashem gives to Elio Anavi is that Hashem is to be found in the small, still voice, in the effectuation. Why? And here's the crucial point, because it's what God wants. Where do I find God? In doing what God wants. How do I become bonded with God? By doing what God wants, because then I have made God the priority. If I'm looking for spiritual experiences, then I'm the priority. It's almost like, and this is probably too harsh a term, spiritual entertainment. I want to see holy people doing holy things. What am I going to do? I'll be impressed. But our message is, it's not about being impressed. It's about being engaged. Why? Because then I'm doing what God wants. Instead of just being, again, this is too harsh a term, entertained by God himself. The same is true when I do the oral mitzvahs. I recite brachas. You know, I, uh, uh, brachas before reading, which is a rabbinic commandment. Brachas after reading, which is a Torah commandment. Reciting the Shema, reciting the davening, saying good morning to somebody. It is also a form of activity. Why is it bring uh, an awareness of Hashem? Because I'm doing it for God. So how am I aware of Hashem when I do something for Hashem? Now, what about relative to when we do a mitzvah with kavana? Now, here's the tricky part. Since we have established, we're going with the, we're going with the premise that mitzvah actions execute the will of Hashem, ipso facto. They are the awareness of Hashem. So what's the kavana got to do with it? Why is kavana important? Now we'd say, well, of course, you can see this. Uh, it's humanly observable. This person is all into it and they're passionate. They got a bounce in their step. They're enthusiastic. And the other, <coughs> excuse me, and the other guy <clears throat> is simply going through the motions. Now they're both eating matzah. They're both putting up the mezuzah. So we say, well, of course, this guy's got enthusiasm and excitement, and he's all gung ho for it. So clearly, that's more godly. Why? That's he likes it. He's passionate about it. There is a perspective that's quite the opposite. An illustration. <clears throat> you recall from the Haggadah, we talk about the four sons: the one wise, one wicked, one simple, and one who knows not how to ask. So the common presumption is that it's a descending order. The wise one is the most lofty. The wicked one, even though he's wicked, but at least he's engaged. The simpleton and the guy in the bottom is the one who knows not how to ask. However, Hasidus, in its classic counterintuitive pushback, says, well, maybe it's the other way around. The guy says, ask? Why should I ask? Whatever you want. I don't have any questions. God said, I'm doing it. This guy's a question and then Alice says, what do you mean? God said, do it. End of story. So there's a certain virtue in not having any quote unquote passion and enthusiasm. What do I want to do? I want to sit on the couch. Why are you sitting on the couch? Because God wants me to eat matzah. So I'm eating matzah. The other guy, I love eating matzah. It's so meaningful and transformative. So 
What happens tomorrow if it's not so meaningful and not so transformative? What if you're not, quote, getting anything out of it? What if you're not getting your spiritual need, needs met? Then you're out of here. Then, you, then you're not. So why is it, what or what is it about kavana, which is this awareness and what that kavana should be, that makes it so special? So here, Alter Rebbe uh, totally uh, gives us, you know, a, a, a blows you out of the water with a, with a different answer than we might have anticipated. So he says like this, and that when a person is, uh, has in mind, that is their intent is, to be attached with Hashem, through fulfilling his will, because Hashem truly wants what he wants. Remember, this is another core message. Uh, Rabbi Friedman says Hashem needs us. This isn't busy work. Hashem didn't say, you know, eat matzah because otherwise you're going to have a chaotic society and you'll forget your past or don't murder because uh, then there'll be rampant uh, violence and so on and put up mezuzahs because otherwise you're going to forget. And then when we get up after 120 years, we say, Hashem, I did it. I kept kosher and I sent my kids to yeshiva and I gave tzedakah. And Hashem says, well, I hope you liked it. What do you mean, Hashem? I did it for you, me. What do I care? I'm God. We say, no, Hashem really does care. Hashem's ratzayin is truly meaningful. It is. He is not just giving us busy work and he's not impetuous and he's not capricious. And he's not just telling us, go and do it because otherwise you bother me or because uh, I'm shallow and I made it up. It's truly, crucially created the whole world. He created you because the world could not fulfill its purpose. Hashem's purpose could not be achieved without your existence in this world. Like the Rebbe once said, or at least it's quoted or attributed or summarized, that your birthday is the day that Hashem said creation was incomplete without you. So when we are doing the mitzvahs, and we're doing it because this is Hashem's will, so too, not only when we're doing a physical action, like eating uh, matzah, when we're doing the verbal mitzvahs, we're reciting the Shema, brachas, and so on. Now, <laughs> here's the kicker part. You ready? Now, what are we doing? We're attaching ourselves intellectually. We're saying, why am I doing this? Because Hashem wants me to, because it makes the world fulfill Hashem's purpose. It makes the world welcoming of Hashem. Look what the Alter Rebbe says. Beloy, it is not. This line here, that begins the chitas of the 25th of Adar, or the 5th of Nisan. Read it read it again. It is not. This is the counterintuitive. It is not because attaching myself to Hashem with my intellect, with my human capacity, is innately greater than doing mitzvahs simply out of the activity. So we are not holding, like I said before, the wise son to be more virtuous than the one who knows not how to ask. We might say quite the contrary. You and your kavana. How much kavana do you have? Who are you kidding? This guy is the total soldier. He does exactly what he's told. Stand up, stand up. Sit down, sit down. Lean to the left, lean to the left. Whatever you tell me. So why is kavana so much better? Not because of what we might, not us, we're perfect. Might, might have presumed that the guy with the bounce and the step and the enthusiasm and the passion and so on. Why is kavana so valuable? Ella only because because God wants us to have kavana. Uh, in an attempt to elevate everything in Reader's Digest, they would have the jokes of humor in uniform about military. So they tell the story that this uh, general's wife calls up the base. She says, it's my child's birthday party. Can you send over some soldiers? Oh, yes, ma'am, we will. Now tell me, though, you know, will these soldiers be good with kids? And the sergeant says, ma'am, if I tell them to enjoy kids, they'll enjoy kids. You know, they're soldiers. You tell them to run up the hill, they run up the hill. You tell them, enjoy it. Not just telling them to do it. I'm telling you to enjoy it. You'll enjoy it. So here's the point that the Alter Rebbe is making. Why is Kavana so important? Not because of what it does for us. Puts a bounce in my step and makes me feel passionate. Through it. Well, that's good. It's, we're not against that. Why is Kavana? Because Hashem wants us to do it because he wants us to do it. Because kavana is like the matzah. 
there is a sort of ongoing, uh, I'll call it tension, maybe it's too extreme a word, between the Hasidim and the Litvisha about davening. In the, in, in the, in the, in, in the Rebbe Rashab's yeshiva that the Rebbe Rashab established to this very day, there is Torah learning, Hasidus learning before davening. First thing in the morning, you learn Hasidus for an hour and a half, and then you daven. Now, there is a lot of pushback against this because they say, what do you mean? The first thing you're supposed to do every morning is daven. You're not even supposed to say good morning to people until you daven. Why am I saying good morning to somebody when I haven't even spoken to Hashem? So why are you learning before davening? So the pushback is because davening requires kavana. How can I roll out of bed, still rubbing the sleep out of my eyes, and have kavana in my davening? I have to learn first, and then I'll have an awareness. And there's a, a, a back and forth about this till this very day. Why is it necessary to have kavana? Because Hashem wants me to have kavana. So just like matzah has to be made of flour and water, and a mezuzah has to be a parchment written by hand, and uh, kashris means I have to separate meat and milk, mitzvahs also require kavana. Why don't I eat meat and milk? Because Hashem said so. Meat is good. Milk is good. Meat and milk is not good. Why? Hashem said so. Why do I have kavana? Because Hashem wants me to have kavana. Now, again, you think about it at the interpersonal level, because we're trying to understand it. When someone does you a a kindness, there is a, 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 I'll call it a joy. Maybe that's too shallow a word. When they do it with with kavana, because you want them to have kavana. You don't just want them to do it out of uh, the, the action, you also want them to be emotionally involved. So why is Kavana excellent, important, significant? Not because of the impact it has so much on the person, that too, but because Hashem wants us to have Kavana. That's the counterintuitive point that the Alter Rebbe has made here. Not for the innate virtue of Kavana, but because that is Hashem's desire. To attach ourselves with our intellect the kavanis ha mitzvahs maisies and the intent in our mitzvah actions. Meaning, again, from a certain perspective, we might say that total surrender of uh, uh, to authority of the infinity of Hashem, what we commonly summarize as Kabbalah soul, I do it simply because God wants me to do it, carries with it a certain better, a certain uh, virtue. In a way, it's better. Well, I'm not doing it because. I want to, because it's meaningful to me, because I get something out of it. I'm doing it simply because it is the will of Hashem. And my kavana is also the will of Hashem. If I tell them to be nice to to like kids, they'll like kids. Not just that they'll be nice to them. They'll like them. Why? Because I gave them that order. And this is that deepest quality that Hashem not only affects my behavior, Hashem not only affects, that's the wrong word, not, not only do I comply in my behavior, I comply in my intellect and in my character. The kavana, kriya shma v'tfilah v'sha brachas, again, even in the verbal recitation of the shma and davening and other brachas. Ba'aras, ratzah, ne'elyan, hazeh, ha'mi'irum, l'obeshes, b'kavana zoi, and the godliness that is found and, in, and is embedded in this kavana, because remember the four stages, where do we find the godliness most evident? Do we find it in the behavior? Do we find it in the kavana? And we've made the analogy that the behavior is like the rock. It's the action. And the kavana is like the more aware levels of godliness. It is far greater, without end. Higher and higher. It, relative to an action that is done without intent, not because we like intent. Again, we're not against it. And again, the bounce and the step thing. It's because Hashem likes intent, because Hashem desires that. Like the greater awareness of Hashem in the neshama over the body. Which is, again, a tool for the neshama. The beginning point, the rock level, the telling the child, do the mitzvah and we'll get you a candy or you'll be compliant or you'll be good or you'll win a prize or whatever it'll be. 
So when we start to see our humanity as being in service of our spirituality, meaning the counter to what we commonly, not us, what we might think that I should do a mitzvah is because it'll make me feel calm and it'll make me feel purposeful and it'll make me feel sanctified. Good, all good things. But then it's about me. So how, how calm do I need to feel? How purposeful do I need to feel? How inspired do I need to feel? I dive and I feel inspired enough. So if it's about what I want, then I do it until I don't want to do it anymore. But if it's about what Hashem wants, then it's constant. So this is now the way we understand the analogy of the body-soul to the mitzvah act and the kavana. Just as we now are turning around our perspective, the classic upside-down chassidus, that the body becomes a handle to get to the neshama, the body becomes a, 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 a tool in the hands of the neshama so that the neshama can execute its purpose of doing mitzvahs because neshamas can't eat matzah, they need a body. Similarly, the, kav, the mitzvah action becomes that encasement and that opportunity for kavana. Now, here's the tricky part. A person might be tempted, animal soul, to say, well, I'll just have kavana. Why do I got to chew the matzah? Why do I got to listen to the shofar? I'll just think about it. I'll just think about the message of matzah. I'll just think about why. It would make sense, except it's not what God wants. It's what I want. And we're here to do, we, we hope to, to, to transform it. Now, again, if we took the common perspective, which the Alter Rebbe has negated here, and we thought that kavana was uh, significant because of how it added pep in my step. So what's the difference if I eat matzah? Well, why do I have to eat it uh, at that time? I'll eat it the next day. Why, why do I even have to do it? I'll just have the kavana about it. I'll have the whole sort of spiritual uptick. So the, po- the pushback is the reason why kavana is meaningful is because Hashem wants me to have kavana and Hashem wants me to eat matzah. So if I'm having kavana and I'm not eating matzah, I'm not doing it for Hashem. Because if I was doing it for Hashem, I do what Hashem wants. Now they're both mitzvahs. The action is a mitzvah and the kavana is a mitzvah. The difference is that in the kavana, it is pshitis. Now pshitis translates as simple, but in our context, simple is a virtue, meaning it's stripped down. It's like the raw godliness. It's not contained in some behavior. And as we know, sometimes we could fall prey into being so overly didactic about the perfunctory that we forgot that we're doing a mitzvah. We get impatient. We get uh, burdensome. We get irritated. We become so fixated on making sure that we chew the matzah exactly this way that we forgot we're doing a mitzvah. Just like parents can get frustrated with their child, born of love, they want their child to uh, be healthy, they want their child to be happy, they want their child to learn, they want them to have some measure of what we roughly call success. And if we're not careful, sometimes we make a mistake and we become overly uh, uh, meddling, et cetera, et cetera. So in the Kavana part, it's totally stripped down. There's none of that. Because the kavana is, this is what Hashem wants. So at that level, there's total awareness. Remember our spectrum of levels of awareness, the four stages, the inanimate, the vegetable, and so on, as we talked about. Um, nevertheless, even though it's the, <laughs> it's the same godliness at every level, it's all absolutely one uh, in the level of godliness, yet the uh, the um, tzimtzum, remember we talked about tzimtzum is the process, the progress and process, is not the same. Is that the same godliness in the rock as in the person? Absolutely. But in the rock, it's more tzimtzumed, and in the person, it's less tzimtzumed. In the mitzvah action, it's more tzimtzum, and in the kavana of the mitzvah, it's less tzimtzum. And that's what we're striving for. But again, it, it's a, the, the temptation say, well, I'll just have the kavana, not the mitzvah. Well, then I'm not doing what God wants, and I'm doing what I want. Now we're in the note. Remember, whenever there's a note, 
it suggests that it's a little bit more academically Kabbalistic. That's why it's in a note. I mean, you could, in a sense, skip it and still continue with the with the uh, rhythm of the chapter. Or the, another way of describing this is what it says in the Eitz Chaim, that in the intent of mitzvahs and Torah study, the intent is like the light. And the behavior is like the keli. Keli translates as vessel or tool. One holds the other. So again, we, nobody wants a soup bowl. We want soup. But without a soup bowl, you can't have soup. But don't get mistaken for the soup bowl and not the soup. I mean, it's like the Rebbe talks about. Nobody goes to make parnasa by saying, I'm going to get a very big wallet to hold all my money. It would be silly. It's all keli and no ur. It's all about the vessel and not about the light. So understand, what's the vessel and what's not? I mean, it's the antithesis of all U.S. marketing. U.S. marketing says, if you have these shoes, you'll run faster. You know, if you wear this uh, coat, you'll jump higher, et cetera, et cetera. It's, a, it's all about the emphasis on the, on the utensil and not on the light. So here, uh, another way of thinking about it is that in a mitzvah, the behavior is the utensil. You need it because you ain't eating soup without a soup bowl. And the kavana is the light. And again, without the soup bowl, you're not having soup. That's again, it's a symptom. So again, uh, the symptom is not antagonistic because again, without symptom, you're not having soup. And without symptoming the or, the I mean, it's again, it's like trying to scoop the ocean out with a with a cup. The or, in order to have it, in order to be able to experience it, it's. It, it, the or, the light, the godliness has to be attenuated to the keli. It's like, you know, you call in the child in first grade and you teach him calculus and you haven't taught him anything. You've just confused him. Not only is he not better off, he's worse off. Not only is he wasted time, he's more confused. So the capacity to tzimtzum, to fit the keli, is again a process. But don't get so consumed with the keli, you know, you get, we can get so caught up with the metaphor, we forgot the lesson. We get so far down the road with the with the story, we forgot the purpose. Back in the text, the nechlek is garb kein la'aba madregis. Again, it's further subdivided into four level stages, like we went over. Gigufa mitzvahs atzman mamish hein beis madregis hein mitzvahs maisius mamish u mitzvahs atulius bedibur machshav k'may talmud teir v'kriishma v'tvila b'chus amazin v'shabrachus. One way we break it down is. There are mitzvahs that are actions. Eat matzah, affix a mezuzah, shake the lulah, hear the shofar. Those are definitive behaviors. Then there are mitzvahs that are a little more humanly specific because, again, you're part of the analogy. You could give a dog matzah. A dog could hear a shofar. But what is the distinctively human is the verbal. So reciting the shema, reciting brachas, and after brachas, and so on, and davening, that is uniquely human. It's a little bit more subtle, a little bit more godly, but it's still in the realm of action. The kavanas ha mitzvahs, and then there's the then there's the intent, which is ledafka bayispar. What is my kavana? I'm doing this to be attached to Hashem. Why do you eat matzah to be attached to Hashem? Why do you put up a mezuzah to be attached to Hashem? She kineshama leguf, which is like the soul to that body. Again, nechlek is gamke neshtei madregas, is also subdivisible, and this is going to be continued. In the next section of the chapter, into two levels. Like two, these other two levels, which are like the animal level of awareness and the human level of awareness. So in the behavioral mitzvahs, you have the domain, the, the inanimate. That's like a, a just a straight up action. Then you have the ones that are a little bit more demonstrative of godliness, like the tzameach, like the vegetative. Those are the verbal. In kavana, which we haven't disco- discovered yet what they are, but we'll see, you have a kavana awareness level that's more uh, godly centered, like an animal compared to a vegetable, and then one even at a more supreme level, a more delicate level, which is like the human quality. And again, as we talked about in the division, that the first two, uh, like the first two letters of Hashem's name, are themselves Hashem's name as well. Okay, we'll stop here. 
Uh, to be continued. Okay. Thank you so 